I lift up my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Ferndale Community Church on this second Sunday of Advent. We're in the Advent season now and we will be lighting the second candle in just a minute. First of all, I have a couple of announcements. One is that there will be no prayer meeting this Wednesday night. And the other one is that I want to give a big thank you to David Griffiths for coming last Monday and helping set up the nativity scene out in front of the church. And thank you to whoever brought the straw and put it out there too. Really appreciate it and it looks great. This morning we are lighting the candle, a uh, Bethlehem candle. And I looked this up, I was doing some research, it's also known as the candle of faith and the candle of peace and the candle of preparation depending on what church you belong to what uh, denomination you're in it can be different things for different people all of them very important and very uh, important to the time so we'll light that candle now commemorating joseph and mary's long and arduous trip to bethlehem uh, according to the king's decree for a census to be taken. And the scripture reading this morning for this lighting actually is part of the, the preparation uh, part of the candle. It comes from Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. And this is what he says. He says, A voice of one calling, In the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God had revealed his plan for salvation for all of humanity through the prophet Isaiah. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this amazing plan that you came up with, for a plan of salvation that was born out of your love for us, your infinite, incredible, uh, immeasurable love that you have for your children. We are so grateful for your plan. We're so grateful for your son, Jesus. Grateful that he came to earth to walk among us, to see what it was like to live a life with us, and then ultimately to die on the cross for our sins, past, present, and future. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning I wanna to talk to you about faith. What is faith? Why do we need it? Why would we want it? How do we get it? And what do we do with it after we get it? It's important things that we need to look at about faith, because faith is important, especially now at this time. People are having a hard time going through some rough time, rough passage. And uh, I think that faith would be something that people could use to help get them through this time. Let's pray. Well, Father God, thank you for this opportunity to look at your word. Thank you for the chance to uh, look at faith and why it is so important to us, and why we need it, especially today, Lord. Make me like a hollow reed, Lord, and fill my mouth with worthwhile stuff and stop me when I've said enough. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a tough time right now. A lot of people are suffering. A lot of people... As I said last week, need encouragement. They're not sure where things are going. Uh, it's hard to know what, what's going to happen. There's a lot of fear out there. So I want to talk about faith and why faith is important. What is faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I had a friend from Missouri once that I talked about faith and, and he said what do you mean you can't see faith and I said no he said well I'm from Missouri show me I couldn't show him 
exactly. But there was a fellow by the name of Thomas one time who doubted Jesus. And Jesus appeared to him and he said, you know, this is me, look and see. And Thomas put his hands in the holes in Jesus' wrists and he put his hand in the side and then he believed because he could see it. But the faith today that we need to have isn't something we can bring out and look at. It's not something we can scientifically test or we can be sure of. But Jesus mentioned faith many, many times in the New Testament when he healed people. There was a woman in Mark who believed that if she just touched his garment, she would be healed. And she did. And he said, who touched my garment? What happened? And he said to her when he found out who she was, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and he be healed of your disease. And that's in Mark 5, 34. There were many other times that Jesus healed people and he always talked about their faith. So let's take a look at faith now. You know, faith is something that we can't see. You can't describe it exactly. You can't measure it, but it's there. So why do we need it? First of all, Romans 3.28 says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works or the law. So the things that we do in life don't save us. The law doesn't save us, following the law. What saves us is our faith. We are justified by our faith. Justified meaning made whole, complete. It's part of the armor of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. The breastplate of faith and love. And the breastplate was that armor that they wore so that the arrows and spears wouldn't pierce their body. And in Hebrews 11.6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So we can't really have faith unless we believe. And what is belief? Belief is a choice. It's a choice we make. It's an opportunity for us to look at life and look at things and say, yes, I believe that, or no, I don't believe it. Sometimes people tell us things and we, we can believe it or not. But faith is hard because it's something we have to believe without seeing it, without knowing what it is. Why would we want it? Hebrews 11.33 says, Who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. That's what people did, people of faith did, in the Old Testament. And in Hebrews, Paul is talking to the Jews, and he's trying to, trying to tell them about Jesus. They resisted that, and so he's trying to explain it and say, this is what faith is. Look what happened to these people because of faith. Now for us, maybe it's not quite as dramatic as that. We're, we're not leading somebody into war or battle or we're not trying to not be eaten by lions as Daniel was. But for us, it might be to put the end to an addiction, repair relationships, settle some differences without reporting to, uh, to resorting to violence and having peace of mind without the future. Those are the things that we can use faith for. You know, I can't imagine today not having faith and living in this world being uh, totally without the power to know the future because we can't see the future. We can't see around the bend. God knows the future. And because I know God, I feel safe because I know he loves me and he cares about me and he's not going to let anything bad happen to me. So if you're suffering from any of the things I talked about, from addiction, if your relationships are not well, good, good, if there's a problem with your relationships, faith can help that. Faith can give you peace. To have an abundant life, that's another reason to have faith. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. 
You know, we don't have to wait to get to heaven to have a good life. We can have it right here on earth. We can have it abundantly. Will life be perfect without pain? No. Jesus warns us in John 16, 33. He says, I have said these things to you that you may, uh, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. What a wonderful message that is. He said we will have tribulation. We will have problems. We're not going to have a perfect, easy life. Part of this living in this world, part of being a traveler here, part of being a stranger in this strange land, not our home in heaven, we're going to face difficulties. We're going to face hard times. We're going to face illness, this disease, this pandemic that we're suffering from right now. But the good news is Jesus has overcome that. He has overcome the world, not by a mighty army or battles, but by loving us, loving us enough to go to the cross, to die for us, to take on our sins today, tomorrow, past sins, no matter what they are. And we will sin, we will sin again, because we're all sinners. No one is not a sinner. If we, if we say we are, we're deluding ourselves, and we're not fooling God. We all sin. Uh, Paul talked about that, you know. He says, I do the things that I, I don't want to do that I shouldn't do, I know I shouldn't do, and I don't do the things I should do because he was human. How do we get it? Well, first of all, faith is a gift from God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so no one may boast. By grace. Grace is not something you earn, something you have to uh, study for, something you have to work hard for. Grace is a gift given freely by God. You know? What do we need to do? We need to believe. Accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. At the end of this message, I'll give you an opportunity to do that if you haven't already. All we have to do is believe. It's very simple. There's no requirements. You don't have to pass some test. You don't have to go out and do anything rugged or, or hard, just simply one thing, believe. Very simple. We need to understand the mystery of faith. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. The mystery. I know people that struggle with Christianity, they struggle with faith because how, you know, how can you explain the Immaculate Conception of Mary? How can you explain Jesus rising from the dead? How can you explain these mysteries that they talked about? Some things are okay, they're just mysteries. We don't have to explain them, we just have to accept them. People were there, we have eyewitness accounts in the Bible. People were there and they saw these things happen. They were there, they were first account people. They said, yes, this is what happened. The other thing is that when we, we want to have this faith thing, God doesn't force us to have faith. He doesn't force any, himself on anyone. He does not make us believe. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. You know, God could have created us as puppets. He could have said, okay, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and made us do things, but he didn't. I like to say the second greatest gift he's given us beside Jesus, his son, is our freedom, our free will. He wants us to come to him because we love him, not because we have to. And that's a choice. That's a choice that we have. Jesus is there knocking at the door, waiting for our answer. And it's very simple. All we have to do is believe. Read the Bible. That's how we get faith. If you don't know Jesus, uh, I suggest you start with Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 1 through uh, 7, 29. This is where you can know who Jesus is as a man. You can know by listening to what he says. I wouldn't go out and read a book all about Jesus. Simply read his words. Don't start with Genesis. 
That's too long and arduous to get to this point. Don't start with the beginning of the New Testament with all the, the, the uh, ancestors of Jesus. I would say start with the Sermon on the Mount because that will tell you all about him. You can learn about him and then you can go on and read other parts of the scripture. You can read those other things later on. Okay, what else do we have? What, what do we do with great faith when we get it? Thank God for it and be grateful. Because like I said, it's not something that we have to struggle for. It's very, very simple. It's grace. It's God's grace. Hold on tight to it. Don't let it escape. Some people will lose faith and they will die. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Continue to read the Bible and pray. Don't let faith slip away. Hang on to it. And most important, share it with others. You now have the secret to life here and the life to come. The easiest way to share it is to practice your faith. Let others see what it looks like to be a Christian. They'll be curious to why you do the things you do, why you suddenly changed. You know, changed over time. It's a conversion. It's a, a paradigm shift. It's a movement from who you were to who you are now, accepting Jesus and who you can be. It's a very simple way to bring that faith about. And when they ask you, What's going on? What's happened to you? Why are you different? You can tell them. You can share your faith with them. You can say, you know, I have somebody in my life right now that I know looks after me and cares about me. I may appear to be alone. I have other people maybe in my life, but I have someone very special who, who knows me, who knows the kind of person I am and still loves me no matter what. And that's Jesus. It's very simple. I'd like to do something right now before we celebrate communion. I'd like to have you pray with me. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know him in your heart, you don't know him personally, I'd like you to pray this prayer with me. And you can pray this prayer anytime. But it's important right now to, to you in your life. If you're suffering, if you're in pain, if you're in doubt, if you don't know where you're going, you're, you're struggling in this time of, of COVID, pray this pray with, prayer with me and watch and see how God will respond because he will. He answers prayer. Will you please pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. If you feel better, if you feel the load is lifted off your back and, and you feel better about life right now, it's because you prayed that prayer. God has answered you immediately. You will feel better and things will change. A simple prayer that I prayed that I talked about last message was God help me. And I prayed it with all my heart and soul and he did. All of a sudden doors opened that were closed and things changed. And they changed for the better. And I became to know him better, to know God better and to know his son Jesus. So if you prayed this prayer, prayer with me, I welcome you at the table because when we have communion, the only qualification you need is to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And that's why I waited until the end of the message to celebrate communion today, to give you an opportunity to have your first communion. So if you have some juice, a cracker, or something at home like that, you can get it out now. You can pause this video for a moment and go get it and you can join your Christian family in remembering the, the sacrifice, the price that Jesus paid 
for our salvation. As we prepare to take communion today, and as I said, if you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you're welcome at this table. You know, there's nobody here in church right now except me and the Lord because of the pandemic, because of the virus out there. We want to keep everyone as safe as we can until this answer that I believe God has given in the shape of a, a vaccine comes to us. So it's just us and you at home. But I want you to join us now as his family, as God's family, in this communion time. And I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11, 26 through 29. It talks about this. And Paul says, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So we need to keep that in mind right now as we spend a little time with the Lord talking to him about the things that we haven't done that we should do and straightening out that relationship with God because it is a relationship between us and the Lord. So let's take a moment silent moment here and talk to God. He's easy to talk to. Just say, Lord, here I am. I'm getting ready to take communion. I want to make sure things are straight with you. I want to make sure that you understand my feelings about my sin and uh, that I'm asking for forgiveness. So let's spend a moment talking with God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this plan of salvation. Thank you for this opportunity to remember the sacrifice that your son Jesus paid for our salvation. The time that he spent on the cross when he took all of our sins on himself. Now, Lord, I ask you to bless us as we take this bread and this cup in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. On the night he was betrayed, <clears throat> Jesus took the bread and when he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread together. The scripture says, <clears throat> excuse me, the scripture says in the same way he took the cup and when he had blessed it and gave it to them saying, take and drink. This is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us. Thank you for your infinite love, your everlasting love. Thank you that we are your children. In Jesus' name, amen. I ask you to think this week about faith, why it's important, why we need it. And think about the opportunities you have of sharing your faith with other people. Because as I said, there are many out there that are hurting and needing love and need to know that they are loved. They need encouragement. They need you to bless them with that. We are blessed as Christians to be a blessing to others. That's why we're here. 
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.